Well, good morning and welcome to worship at Manasquan Presbyterian Church and happy first day of Advent, everyone. Before you know it, it's like Advent's going to be here. We'll be saying that in February, right, Dave? Well, it is Advent and we're really excited about it, time in which we celebrate Christ's birth and uh, celebrate the coming of Christ in, in Jesus and, and celebrate the second coming of, of Christ our Lord and Savior. So we're very thankful that we're here on this first Sunday in Advent. Um, in your bulletin, there's a couple of announcements. We have, um, it's kind of exciting because several people have contacted Abel Lento, our director of congregational life, and have expressed, even amidst all of this time of virtual services and pandemic maneuvering, that uh, there's some people that are interested in um, finding out more about the membership of Manasquan Presbyterian Church. So we're going to have a um, new member information class next Sunday, and that will be following this service. It will either be in the um, upper room, which is this room here, or here in Fellowship Hall. So we, uh, if you know anyone who's interested in, in membership, please let them know and, and come to that. Also, next Sunday is pretty exciting for this service, for our 11 o'clock service. We have a growth group here that is the Christian Writers uh, Ministry growth group, and they have done worship services throughout the course of the year for the last several years. And uh, they came to me a while ago and asked if they could do a service on a Sunday morning at the 11 o'clock service. So next Sunday at 11 o'clock, our service will be um, by the Christian Writers Ministry, and they'll have readings from the writings that they do, and also songs that they have put together, and it's going to be a wonderful thing. So let everybody know, come back next Sunday at 11 o'clock. It'll be a great, a great time. Um, Wednesday night, we have our uh, Simply Jesus worship service, and, and Dave Valenta and Pastor David Cotton are uh, leading in that with many other people, so we encourage you to come to that. We had a break last week because it was the day before Thanksgiving, but it'll be starting back up on Wednesday night. Uh, a lot of people have asked me, what are our plans for uh, uh, navigating the pandemic and having virtual services? Uh, I've been talking to a lot of the other pastors in the area. Some of them are going to virtual services again. I have shared um, our, our thoughts with this session, and right now where we're at is based on the protocols and the safety. Do you feel pretty safe coming in here? It's like, yeah, put the hand sanitizer on, keep your mask on, and uh, uh, check your temperature. We, we wipe everything down. So with the protocols that we have, um, our goal is to keep our services open and to have them. If something like that changes, we will let you know as we go forward. Uh, so for right now, our services on Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30, and 11, and then our Wednesday service at 6.30 are gonna continue until further notice. On Christmas Eve, we're gonna have our um, family children's Christmas service, and that service, instead of being inside the sanctuary, because we can get as many as 250 people at that, it's gonna be outside in our parking lot. So we're gonna have that out there, uh, weather permitting, hopefully we don't have two feet of snow or a monsoon. But if it's a light drizzle, we'll still have it. Bring your umbrella. Um, and then at 8 o'clock, we're having our uh, candlelight service with uh, glow sticks. And it's going to be glow sticks because we're, we're, our plan is to be in the Algonquin Theater. And uh, with social distancing, we can have more seats than we can have in our, our church uh, sanctuary. Uh, so we'll have that. But seating will still be limited, so uh, please come early. Uh, that service will be at 8 o'clock in Algonquin. Unless, of course, things change. If they do, we will let you know. I want to invite you now to uh, just uh, prepare for our worship service. We have a, uh, a, a brief verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and then the lighting of the Advent candle. Mm -hmm. Sunday in which we recall the hope we have in Christ. 
The prophets of Israel all spoke of the coming of Christ, of how a Savior would be born, a king in the line of David. They spoke of how he would rule the world wisely and bless all nations. On Christmas Day, the Christ of our hope was born. On Good Friday, the Christ of our hope died. On Easter Day, the Christ of our hope rose from the dead. He then ascended into heaven. On the last day, the Christ of our hope will come again to establish his kingdom over all things on earth. As the followers of Christ, we await his return. We light this candle to remember that as he came to us as humbly in the manger at Bethlehem and gave light to the world, so he is coming again in power to deliver his people. We light this candle to remind us to be alert and to watch for his return. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the hope you give us. Help us prepare our hearts for the Lord's coming. Bless our worship. Help us live holy and righteous lives. We ask it in the name of the one born in Bethlehem. Amen.
Yes, to go and to bless our church. To bless our families. Lord, we are grateful for your certainty in our lives. In this world that just seems so uncertain today, we have certainty in you. We have truth in you. We have comfort in you. We have peace in you. Let us hold these truths close to our hearts as we prepare to receive your word today. In your name, amen. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment now um, for a time of offering and, and gratitude and, and thankfulness. We don't have a formal time of offering, as you guys know by now. There's some boxes located near the exits, uh, and you can visit those if you leave as the Spirit uh, prompts you to do that. But let, let, let's just focus for a few moments here on, on the certainty of God, on the certainty of His grace in our life, on the, on the certainty of His truth in our life. When everything else uh, seems uncertain, uh, we have this foundation to stand on that is that is cause for, for joy, that is cause for celebration, that is cause 
for gratitude in each and every one of our lives. So let us focus on that for, for just a few moments here. salvation, Lord. Help us to also be aware that that salvation is now nearer than when we first believed, Lord, that, that you have given us so many gifts, so many opportunities, and a limited amount of time here on earth to glorify you, to use what you've given us to be good stewards of all that you have entrusted us with before you come again, Lord. So let us understand that. Let us, let us look at our lives, examine ourselves, and, and be grateful. Lord, and, and look for opportunities to give you glory. Look for opportunities to use what you've gifted us with each and every day. In your name, amen. Anybody feel like life today's kind of a marathon? <laughs> you, you heard the expression that uh, life isn't a sprint, it's a marathon, and never so true as, as it is these days, I think. Um, the problem with running a marathon is that, that you know, we, we start like this. I mean, look at that guy in the red shorts. Man, he's happy, he's on top of it, he's got a big smile on his face, I'm running this thing, I'm doing this marathon, this is great! But the problem is, a lot of times we end up more like this, after we go for a while, you know, and that big smile and that positivity and that great attitude and all of that that we have at the beginning, it goes away somehow. My, uh, my granddaughter Emily is living with us this year and she is a... Uh, a proud member of the var girls' varsity cross-country team at uh, Point Pleasant Borough, undefeated, I might add, throwing a little shout-out to my granddaughter. And she says there's a time in every race that it just hurts. Can I get an amen? There's just a time in every race, including the race of life, where it just hurts. But if you can power through it and find your way to the other side and get your rhythm back, you can make it work, and you can find your groove, and you can find what you need, and you can find the resources, and you can go on. 
I kind of read everything. I'm an omnivore reader. And I found this article by someone who runs marathons saying, here are some tips. Here are my ways of being successful in running a marathon. And I thought, that will preach. And here we are. So we're going to talk about running the marathon of life. So I took the, the tips that he gave and I brought them into my sermon. And I want to talk about them both physically and, and spiritually so that we can talk about running the marathon of life. So the first thing he said is basics matter. That your physical health is important and good self-care is important. And God cares about that too. God cares about our bodies. There are only two ways that Jesus told us we should love our neighbors. And loving our neighbors is equal importance to Jesus with loving God. We all understand that, right? I don't know that we emphasize that in, in church enough, not necessarily this church, but in all Christian churches, that Jesus said they are equal. That loving God and loving our neighbor, it's not like loving God is here and loving our neighbor is the second string. It, they're equal. And he only said two ways that we should love our neighbors and one of them is as ourselves jesus wants us to care for ourselves he wants us to practice good self-care he cares about our bodies because we're his beloved children he knows that we need to be healthy to face this marathon of life all right but he also knows that health is more than just physical health I've got a secret for you. My brilliant medical friends at the hospital are beginning to learn what the writer of Proverbs knew 3,000 years ago. <laughs> that what happens up here and what happens in our emotions and our thoughts and our dreams, all of that has an effect on our bodies. That everything is connected. So the writer of Proverbs, probably Solomon, said a joyful heart is good medicine but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So our spirit, our inner strength, our, our emotional strength, our mental strength, all of those have an effect on our overall health. And I don't know about you, but my bones are drying up way too fast as it is. So I, I need to keep my spirit good so that it doesn't dry them up anymore. I want the juice of the Lord Jesus Christ to be flowing through me and keep me young and keep me ready to go and keep me on board so that I can run the race of life. So basics matter and they matter to the Lord. The second thing he said is that you can't just go out and say one day, I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow. If anybody's ever run any distances, you know you've got to work up to it. Amen? Head shake. You've got to build yourself up to it. You've got to run two miles and five miles and 10 miles and 12 miles and 20 miles to get to the to the marathon stage. And so he says the best way to build endurance is to establish a routine, and once you get into that routine, to keep your streak going, to keep it going, to not let it sort of fade away. So one of the interesting things that, that we know about people who leave the church, leave the faith community, is they don't leave because they're angry at God. They don't leave because they have some big theological problem. They don't even leave because they have a problem with us. Right, Jim? <laughs> they leave because they just get out of the habit. It's the number one reason that people leave the church. They just, they don't go for one Sunday. And then it's two, and then it's 10, and then it's 15, and they're done. So. One of the ways that we can keep our endurance going is to establish a routine. And once we get that routine, to keep the streak going, let's take a look at what Paul says to the Romans. He says, never be lacking in zeal. Isn't that an awesome word, zeal? I mean, we don't hear that word much today, but, but zeal, like, like, don't live like Eeyore, like, okay, another day, you know? Be Tigger. Go at the world. Just dive into the world and have zeal and keep your spiritual fervor, your spiritual fire. That's another way to say that. It's just let your spirit be on fire for the Lord. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. You guys know that that's one of my favorite verses because it just kind of covers the way we should live. Joyful in hope about the future, patient in the affliction that we have right now, and faithful in prayer. And why have I highlighted the third one? Because it goes along with establishing a pattern. For almost 30 years, I worked every day with people who tried to figure out how to pray at the worst moment of their life. And that is not the time to try to figure out how to pray. 
But if we, if we establish a pattern of prayer, if we pray every day, you know, one of the things that works for me is to have a trigger to, to, for when I pray. Like when I start the car, that, I don't pray for 10 minutes when I start the car, but when I start the car, that's my trigger. Like, okay, say a prayer for somebody right now. Use that. Establish a pattern so that prayer is a part of the daily life, like brushing your teeth or, or you know, eating your breakfast. Saying a prayer is part of everyday life because then that prayer is in you. Um, Dave and I at the, at the Wednesday evening service, we're teaching people some simple prayers to just have at their disposal. When the difficult time come, times come and the words don't come, having those prayers inside of you is, is establishing a pattern. All right? But you know what? We're going to get it wrong. We're going to do it wrong. We're not going to do it enough. We're going to do it right, but not enough. We're, we're going to mess up. But guess what? God doesn't love us for our performance. And God doesn't love us for our perfection. God loves us because we're his children. I love my children and my grandchildren because they're mine, not because they're perfect. They're almost, <laughs> especially the grandchildren. The children, uh. But God loves us because we're made in his image and we're his children. So we're going to mess it up. But guess what? We don't have to do all of this in our own strength. When we're building endurance, Part of building endurance is not just our own endurance, but our endurance at sticking close to Jesus because it's his strength that gives us the, the, the ability to do whatever we have to do to run this marathon, to run the race of life. Paul says it this way, I can do all things. I can do anything because Christ gives me strength. I don't have to do it on my own strength because I can call upon him. So. Building our endurance is staying close to Jesus and tapping into his strength when ours is weak. It's establishing a pattern of coming to church, of reading our Bibles, of doing a Bible study, of, of praying every day, and just having that be a basic part of life and building our spiritual fervor, our spiritual fire, as we continue to run the marathon of life. So spiritual endurance is important. And the third tip that he gives is don't try to run a marathon alone. You need a support system. You need somebody to cheer for you and hold up a sign when you've had it, when you're done, when you're finished, to give you some water or some Gatorade or something as you're, as you're running by to take the clothes that you're stripping off because you're too hot and you throw them on the ground. And you need a support system. To, to Anybody ever exercised and, and, or run or swam or done something like that and with a partner or with, with a group that you have? You know, when you have a partner, when you have somebody with you, on the days that you don't feel like it, they call you up and make you feel good. I mean, they call you up and, and encourage you to go exercise. And then on the days that they don't feel like it, you bring them along. So we all need a support system. So he said, ask for help, and I added, and give it, because it's not copyrighted and I can change it if I want, all right? And then he says, shore up your relationships, connect and communicate. So what about our support network? Here's what Jesus says. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And then a little bit later he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So we need a support system, and that support system needs to start with Jesus. It needs to start with his strength, and he invites us to come for help. Jesus does not see asking for help as weakness. He sees it as a strength because we trust him. Because we know that when we go to him, he will do for us what we need. Not always what we want, but what we need. So he invites us. He invites you. He invites me. When we're in that pain place where it's just pain, he says, come to me. Bring your pain to me. Nail it to the cross. And let me take my... You, the yoke upon myself and pull with you, run with you, struggle with you, persevere with you, and succeed with you and find victory with you. So he invites us to come and ask for help. But then he says, look, I've given you so much. The reason I've given it to you is not so that you can clutch it and keep it to yourself. I've given it to you so that you can share it with others. Here's what Paul says in his letter to the Romans. He says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. 
If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouraging, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And so he says, look, share your gifts. Be the support system for someone else. When we talk about a Christian support system, we talk about the one that supports us, but we always have to talk about the one where we support someone else. And he says, we, you can't do it the same way somebody else can do it. I mean, I kind of always want the gifts that somebody else has. Is that, can I get a head nod there? Like, God has given me the ability and the gift of doing certain things, and I always want to do the other stuff that somebody else can do. But Paul reminds us, take what God has given you, take the gift, and you be, be the support system for someone else. Just like when the, when the Pharisee asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus told him how to be a neighbor. Well, how do we do with, it, with the support system? You be the support system for some, somebody else, some other somebodies, and let them, allow them to be the support system for you. And use the gifts. And then he says, join a group or create one. You know, the first century followers of Jesus had no business even surviving. The most powerful empire in the history of the world up to that time, and maybe ever, the Roman Empire was against them. And the Jewish authorities that ran everything in the country were against them. They only succeeded because God had it in his plan from the beginning to redeem all of humankind, to bring back the Garden of Eden. And he sent his son to establish and, ab and abolish sin in our lives and give us that hope. But they themselves had something to do with the, the success of the early Christian church too, because they stuck together. Look at, look at what Luke tells us in Act, the Acts of the Apostles. He said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They stayed together. They stuck together. They, they, they had that symbiosis of being together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See the result of it? People saw how together they were, and they wanted to be a part of that. I never thought I would enjoy a fire pit so much as I have now that uh, we have COVID-19, right? Come on, anybody else the aficionado of the fire pit? Man, I could build a fire. I could get my Eagle Scout badge. <laughs> but one of the things I've noticed about the fire at the end of the evening is it's still burning and the coals are still bright and, and, and on fire. But, you know, I only have to do one thing to put out the fire. Separate them. Once you separate the flame goes out very quickly. But if you keep them together, that heat stays. If you're, if you're a camper, you know that you can keep it there and, and start the fire in the morning when you get up from what, what's left of the coals if you keep them together. It's the same thing with us. We need to stay together as followers of Jesus. We need to understand that, that Christianity was always meant to be personal, but never meant to be private. And we need to come together and pray together and work together and find the same kind of success that the first century Christians did. And then he says, shore up your relationships, connect and communicate. And we need to start our connection and our, and our shoring up of our resources and relationships with Jesus. And I love what Jesus says here. He says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to be fresh and green. You're going to live a life with zeal. You're going to live a life that's, that's, that's growing and blooming and blossoming. But if you separate yourself from me, it's like the branch that gets separated from the vine, and it withers and it dies. Maybe if we're withering under the marathon of life, it's because we are not connected to the vine. Maybe we've started to think that we are the vine. It's one of the things that he tried to get across to Israel, because Israel considered itself to be the vine. And Jesus says, nah, not backwards, folks. I'm the vine. I'm the source of life. I'm the source of that nourishment. I'm the source of energy. I'm the source of renewal. So one of the things we need to do is make sure we stay connected to the vine. And then he says this, how do you stay in that love? That's how you get there. You get connected to the vine. How do you stay there? He says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. And he tells us how. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. 
just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And then he answers the unspoken question, so what is the command? My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. If we live there, if we stay there, if we come be connected to Jesus and live out that connection by loving one another, then we will stay in the vine, then we will keep growing, then we will find the strength to go on when, when life is just painful. We'll find the courage, we'll find the commitment, and we'll find the success at the end. And then he, he tells us, listen, look, look at me. I know what the right thing to do is. I know how much I should eat and how much I shouldn't, which is a bad thing to say several days after Thanksgiving, all right? I know what I, when I should exercise, I know all of the stuff I should do, and I know all of the stuff that I shouldn't do. And that, and two bucks, will get me a cup of coffee at Starbucks. It's not knowing what to do. Is it $2? <laughs> <laughs> not, the, not what I get. <laughs> Starbucks charges you by the word, and I just say, coffee. All right? One word is $2. If you get the latte frappe vente, it's a, it's a dollar a word. How did you get me off that? It doesn't, knowing what to do doesn't get you anything. It's doing what we should do and not doing what we shouldn't do. And Paul gives us this wonderful reminder and gives us this perfect example. Look at what he says. He says, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. He says, don't just listen to it. You can't just know. You can't just come and hear the word of God or read the word of God or go to Bible study and understand the word of God and just not do it. And he says, doing that is like going in the mirror in the morning. Anybody go to the mirror in the morning and look in the mirror and go, ugh. Ugh. Something's got to be done about that. Huh? I don't know about you, but my hair goes north, south, east, and west all at the same time in the morning. Well, that's not your problem, I know. But. And he says, you know, knowing the word of God, what we should do to stay connected to him, but not doing it, is like looking in the mirror and saying, oh, something's got to be done about that, and then just going on and not, not changing anything, not fixing anything, not, not caring for anything. Isn't that a perfect example? He says, it's not knowing what to do, it's doing it. So in the final analysis, if we're going to run the marathon of life, we not only have to know what to do to do that, we have to actually get ourselves to do it. And the last step is that this person who runs all these marathons said, it's not, it's not from the waist down that decides whether you're going to be successful at a marathon. It's from the neck up. It's what you get in here, because there's a certain time and there's a certain place where you start getting the negative messages. It's too cold, it's too hot. You had too much sleep, you didn't get enough sleep, right? You had too much for breakfast, you didn't have enough for breakfast. You ate too much protein, you, you, know, you know how it goes, all right? You get, start getting those messages. He says that it's their mindset that matters, and your emotional endurance is as important as your physical. And the subsets under that are remember your why, think about each step, fight for your goals, and imagine the end. And I read those and thought, I can deal with those. So here we go. Remember the why. Paul says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Even when earthly things are going wrong and going badly, we have a place in heaven with Jesus. We have a risen Savior who lives and is seated at the right hand of God and prays for us. Keep our minds on things above and remember the why. Number two, think about each step, but remember the bigger picture. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. He, he, the therefore comes after. He says, look, we're, we're all dying. We understand that. But when we have Christ living inside of us, we have this life that's being generated in us. It's not just that our bodies are dying, our spirits are being regenerated and actually growing and moving toward connection with Jesus. 
So he says, we don't lose heart. Outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles now are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do we do? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And that's just kind of backwards with the world we live in. We live in the world of what we can see, of what's in front of us, of what we experience, of what we taste and touch and feel. But God says, yes, I want you to live in that world. I sent my son to live in that world to show you who I am. But I never want you to forget that that's not the only world, and that's not even the most important world. We are citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is there. And we have all the rights and benefits and privileges of that citizenship. And we need to grab onto them and live as children of the king. And he says, fight for your goals. And Paul says, you know, it's not like I've already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on because I want to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He says, I have to just leave some of the past in the past, and I have to keep moving on and keep my eyes fixed on Jesus and move heavenward because I know I've been guaranteed that my prize is being face to face with Jesus, of having all my questions answered, of having all the pain and all the suffering and all the sorrow and all the tears gone for eternity and being re reunited in that beautiful place at the table with all of my friends and relatives who have gone there before me. And he says, imagine the end. <laughs> when you're in the middle of it and it's just pain, think about the finish line. Imagine the end. He says this to Timothy and his life is at the end. He's in Roman prison. And he's been in Roman prison and gotten out of Roman prison once and he knows it's not going to happen again. And he says to him, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. But not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So he uses racing, running language. And he says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now I get the crown. Not the golden crown with the jewels like a king would wear. That's, that's diadem. The Greeks had a couple words for crown. Not that golden crown, but the, remember when they instituted the modern Olympics in Athens and they gave them the crown of laurel wreaths around the head the, that, for the winners for the gold medals? That's what they gave for a gold medal. So if we were going to translate this into modern language, we would say, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith, and now there is in store for me the gold medal that says that I'm the winner. They didn't give gold medals in those days because there wasn't anything to pin them to. If you know what I mean, you know, if you've ever seen that, well. So he says, but not just to me, to everybody. So if we run the race, and we connect with Jesus, and we support others and let them support us, if we keep our eyes fixed on the prize, if we keep our spiritual fervor, if we keep our emotional endurance going, and our spiritual endurance going, then there's the crown of righteousness, the crown of of victory for us at the end of the race. And instead of sprawled on the, on the ground and gasping for air, we can finish like this. This is Joni Benoit, the first American woman to win the Olympic marathon. And look at the look on her face. It's a look of victory. She's tired, yeah, but she's got the victory. And we, you and I, can end up with the crown the crown of life, the crown of eternity. So let's run the race. Let's keep the faith. Let's remember to grab onto Jesus and keep with him and let his strength be our strength and run the race and finish strong and find the crown face to face with Jesus. Amen.